Hello everyone, how goes it today? I think there was no audio in that countdown, am I correct? Was there no audio in the countdown? Because, uh, things, things. Basically, last week, short version, is last week, not last week. There was no live show last week, but in the last live show, the weekly game show that Meg ran, uh, I, I think I copied over the old audio file, which means I need to find the old audio file or create a new one, but I managed to find a backup one, so there is that. But that's kind of where we are right now. Uh, past that, just as a heads up, there are some people working on the AC. I mentioned this a few weeks ago. Um, I mentioned this, I don't know, maybe a month and a half by now. But I had to get a whole furnace and AC replaced. And so the AC is currently, the furnace was replaced like a week and a half ago. But the AC is currently being replaced in the other room. So if you hear bangs or booms or dents or if someone has to come out and talk to me, that's just the uh, price of admission. But past that, past that, my first board game countdown that I couldn't skip. Does that mean you're on time, Richard Learns Games? Let's go ahead and get caught up over here. Let me go ahead and pop this open to full screen. I like the uh, chat in full screen over here. But uh, we are going to have our live stream this week. Next week, I have to figure out what to do. I might try to do the live stream earlier in the week, but next week, Thursday, I'll be at PAX East, which means um, no live stream next week, Thursday, unfortunately. Actually, I'm going to move this over here now that I made it full screen. I know I just moved it back and forth. But next week, Thursday, I'll be at PAX East. Uh, the week after that, I'll be at Adam at the Gamers Ranch, which means, oh boy, oh boy, unless I make the live stream, I have to figure out when and how I want to do this, but I don't want to miss... I don't want to miss the live streams for three weeks in a row. So I'm going to have to figure out what it is I do. Oh, by the way, I don't think I'm going to say this, but hi, I'm Alex Rackle from Board Game Co. Welcome to the weekly live and Q&A and all this stuff. Oh, as usual, as the Q&A, feel free to ask whatever it is you want. We'll get you everything and or I'll just talk about things as we go, including, by the way, including some of you have commented on my new set. So I have a new set I'm working with. This set is still around. It's not going anywhere, at least not yet. But I am working on a new set slowly but surely. It's a... Uh, filtering into videos a bit here and here and there, although I've already received some feedback on the new set, which I appreciate. Uh, feedback is good uh, in general. Uh, in general on the channel, uh, feedback is always appreciated, because I had one person who commented, like, you know, ignore everyone else's set looks great, which I appreciate that too, don't get me wrong, but I do appreciate helpful feedback. Sometimes I just can't or don't want to take it into account. So for example, frequent requests for B-roll, which I, whenever they happen, I'm like, you know what? I get a lot of passion out of creating videos, I'm talking about board games, playing board games. I don't get that same satisfaction out of creating B-roll. And since the time, the time benefit payoff isn't there, and it's not as satisfying to me, it's something that I won't do, but I understand the request for it. There's times where I might disagree with feedback, and that's okay too. The only feedback I have no time or patience for is feedback delivered rudely. That just gets an instant block and gone. If you're, if you, I don't, I can't think of a good example offhand, but if your feedback is toxic in the way it's delivered, I have no patience for it, and I also ignore it, because if the person, the person who wants that change, if that, they're the kind of person who talks rudely on the internet, I just discount where that's coming from. But otherwise, feedback in general is appreciated, and I got a lot of feedback on the new set as far as the lighting and different things, and it is still a work in progress. This thing's going to be tweaking and adjusting. Uh, if or when it gets to a final point, I'll let you know, but otherwise, constant feedback is appreciated as I tweak around with things. Like, I could have just gone for the exact same look, but that's not the point. I want different vibes to a degree. Similar vibes. I want it to feel like a board game co-set, but I want different yet similar vibes. Anyways, I lost track of things. Q&A, live, yeah, live stuff. I'll try to have a live thing next week and or the week after. I don't know when because it can't be Thursday either of the next two weeks. I travel too much in case that wasn't clear. Fractious Guy, with Fractious Guy, hey, Pariah, hello all. JB, with Fractious Guy being fulfilled in the Veilfit expansion launching Kickstarter, is curious what your current ranking of Ivy Studios games is with the expansion for some included. So, Mythic Mischief is straight up at the top of all of all of um, Ivy Games games. Uh, below Mythic Mischief is probably, ooh, is hard. So this is where it gets tricky. All the rest of the games get tricky for me. I really like Moonraker solo and or co-op, but the problem is you have to use the app for that, which means on the one hand, gameplay-wise alone, I like it the most, but I don't like having a computer screen up as I play games. I just don't love it. It is something I'm willing to do, but not something I love doing. So that's tricky there. Um, I do enjoy Moonrakers with the expansions a decent amount. It is one that I finally got rid of because, again, decent amount is not enough in the world of great games we have and great games that are there to play. But I do enjoy it. I'm always down to play Moonrakers with expansions. Moonraker based game, I think I'm all happy to play with some caveats, but all happy to play. There's just reason I don't know them. Moonrakers, like I said already, I covered that one. I think above Moonrakers is Fractious Guy. Fractious this guy is a lot of fun. I think it's a very solid game. My biggest thing, I've said this before, is I would always pick City of Spies over it. I have City of Spies, the Sotril 1942. I love that game very, very much, and it gives me the same vibes as Factious Guys. But Factious Guy would be my next one. Below that would be Moonakers with Expansions. Again, just limited time to play all the games I like to play. And then below that is Veiled Fate. 
Now, Veil of Fate is my least favorite, although I will say I've only played with one of the new expansion modules, and it definitely enhanced my opinion of the game. I still don't need to own it. It's a game that, unfortunately, Veil of Fate, I'm primarily going to enjoy the most at six to eight players when you have the teams mode in. That's when it's the best. But I don't play games with six to eight players that often, so I don't need to own it. And I have a friend local who uh, does own it, and I'll happily play it with him whenever he wants. So, all of Ivy Studios games are games that I genuinely enjoy and I'm happy to play. The only one that I love enough to currently own is Mythic Mischief. Uh, let's see, where are we? We got Mikhail. Hi, just to be my all in a seven citadel. So do I. So did I. I have no need for more dice towers. I didn't see the dying light dice tower, so I don't know. Good day, all. What's up with you, Pariah? I'll let Pariah answer that if you didn't already. Uh, hey, hey, hey. Hey, friends. I'm doing dishes. Meg, enjoy your dishes, or I guess not enjoy. Enjoy might, might not be the right word. We have 13 months. Successful geek. Thanks for joining up, being a member for 13 months. I really appreciate you. You're pretty awesome. Uh, Brian, get those chores done, as always. Uh, Andre, just got here. Did you guys get Primal? I have Primal on the way. I finally got a tracking notification. It's not yet here, but I'm very excited for when it shows up. I will be diving in as soon as I can, hopefully. Uh, let's see. Daniel Chance, afternoon, everyone. Yes, no audio. Well, no audio doing the pre-thing at this point, I hope. Otherwise, I should be paying attention to. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, get those chores done. Got here. Do you guys do Primal? Afternoon, everyone. No audio. Wow, my first Burning Code countdown. Red for Clown. Hi, Alex. I'm curious. Have you ever played Star Wars Outer Rim? And if so, what are your thoughts? Um, hi, Alex. Uh, have you played... I have not played Star Wars Outer Rim. I've played Zaya. I have not played Firefly. I have not played Star Wars Outer Rim. Just Zaya. Sindaka, you're going to have coverage of the Dead Keep. I love the Paul Bonner character art, but so far the board game looks like a different style. Inconsistent art in the game bothers me. Um, I will be covering the Dead Keep, actually. I believe Tracking has it as delivering tomorrow. There'll be a preview and a gameplay on the channel. As usual, when I'm doing sponsored content, I try to, uh, if I'm doing a sponsored preview, or Meg's doing a sponsored preview, and we're doing a sponsored gameplay, uh, there will not be an official review, at least right now. I'll probably try to review it down the road when the final copy comes. But of course, if you ask me for my thoughts, I will give them. It's just, it's a weird disparity in general, but paid content and preview content like there are times like right now with um river valley glassworks i will be doing with river valley glassworks i will be doing a review unpaid and a sponsored gameplay and i try to avoid doing that it does happen at times i try to avoid doing that in this case the reason that happened is because they reached out to me and uh, said can you review this game and i said absolutely and then later in the process they said we'd like to sponsor a gameplay too so i didn't want to take away the review so i still did it with appropriate disclaimers but i understand it muddies the water any financial tie-in of course muddies the water you have to uh use your judgment for context by the way i gave it a 3.5 out of 5 like i do like river valley glassworks but i i think it's limited in what it does i'm saving the whole time watching the review i guess my point is is both things are true. Um, you should be mindful of any, even if the video itself is not sponsored, you should, of course, be mindful of any sponsored relationship and the tie in there. Uh, and that, that is what it is. And I'll try to be transparent and hopefully my actions and lack of praising every single thing that I just happen to get paid for hopefully should be clear about. But yeah, take it with a grain of salt. Anyways, my point, I'm, lo I'm losing track. Point is, I will be covering Dead Keep. Uh, ask me my opinion at any point, but I will probably not review it until the final game comes. We'll be doing a preview and a gameplay now. Uh, successful. Are you adding any add-ons to the Spiritfire PM on GameFound? I haven't gone through it yet, so I uh, can't answer that. Actually, weirdly enough, as the GameFound side of things, I've been dealing with, uh, you know, Tom from Oneb and dealing with our team, trying to help them out. So I've been dealing with Spiritfire PM a lot, just as a GameFound person, not as a customer person. Allison, hey, hey, friend. Hey, Allison, how's it going? Who's Games, how are you? Uh, let's see. Um, have you gotten Dar Duke Johnny? Hello, Alex, Professor Mag. Do either of you plan to do a preview of Under Our Sun? I'm not familiar with that one, so I'm going to say I don't know. Uh, Allison, we're headed to Northeast next week for Spring Break and Great Plains Games. Ooh, enjoy. Spring Break, Great Plains Game Festival. I'm not familiar with Great Plains Game Festival, but enjoy that. Oh my, time to rant about Spectrum. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, did we have... Did we have um, the internet happen? Did the internet get all spotty? Is that a me thing happening right now? Uh, for short version, uh, the Spectrum debacle is going to be finally over. I actually filmed a full video ranting about Spectrum because, dear lord, I want to talk about it. Like, there's a full channel video that will be going up just complaining about Spectrum. Uh, Spectrum, TV, internet, all that. I don't know what will go up, but hopefully soon. But, dear lord, I'm frustrated. Uh, we are switching back to AT&T Fiber. That will be happening by the end of the month in March. I don't know exactly when. It might happen sooner. It depends on when stuff happens and equipment and travel and all that. But, dear lord, it is... um. Spectrum has been a nightmare, and I don't just mean the service. I don't mean, like, the internet service. I mean, just, it's been a nightmare. There'll be a full video on that, in case you want to uh, hear me rant for 20 minutes about Spectrum Internet. 
Uh, Stacy, Breath of Fresh Air, the classic Q&A live show. Hello, Stacy. Uh, Pariah ran away. Press the Meg. Good to see everyone. Hello, BGC is a successful geek. Here you are from Meg. <laughs> How dare you? Uh, press Meg. Alex, will I have AT and T? Alex will rant about Spectrum. Oh, she has AT and T internet. Got it. Uh, Stacy, I was just thinking this morning I have to wash dishes every day and I don't enjoy it. Uh, yeah, dishes are one of those things that just like changing your clothes every single day and um, making the bed every single morning. There's some things in life that's just showering, showering. Like, why do you have to shower all the time? Back in the day, I think they like washed themselves like once a month and everyone seemed just fine. Granted, they mostly died when they were 40, but like they seemed just fine past that. So I don't know why we shower every day. Cat, I was happy to happy to catch the live show while I pack my game my game bag for Breakout Con this uh, this weekend. Enjoy Breakout Con, have fun. Say hi to Jennifer us, uh, you know, or I mean, don't harass people, but say hi to Jennifer us. Priya, dishes are my zen after making coffee in the morning. Dirty dishes in the sink drive me insane. I do not like dirty dishes. I'm a huge. I I don't know. I'm someone who likes washing dishes as I go. I. There are times you have to let things soak, and I get that. My problem is, as soon as you let one thing soak, the next dish is that much easier to put in, the next dish is that much easier, and before you know it, you don't even have time to wash the dishes. So I am a huge fan of washing as I go, but I understand there's times, situations, things that need to soak, uh, when you're cooking a lot and there's a bunch of stuff. There are times where it needs to back up, but uh, that's what dishwashers are for. Nir, have you played Firefly? I played it last night, found it somewhat dull and very luck-driven. Curious your thoughts. I have not played Firefly, but I did just do a video today about... So I actually talked about it. I mentioned earlier in the stream that I haven't played Firefly yet, but past that, um, I did a video today. I filmed it this morning, actually, of 10... What was it? it was, I basically, the video topic was that I prefer non-IPs to IPs in general. I find... I'm not even talking about the gameplay. I'm not even saying whether the gameplay is better or not. I'm just saying I prefer a non-IP to an IP usually. Uh, I find that when you translate an IP to a board game, to a certain extent, it feels like it loses some of the initial magic, to a certain extent, and uh, versus I like IPs, I like non-IP board games. So, for example, one of the ones I gave is Zia versus Zaya versus Firefly is I'd rather play Zaya over Firefly. Sometimes the IP game is more popular or sells more, but I generally prefer non-IPs. Although I plan on doing a follow-up video, of course, because why not, about the uh, 10 IPs that I really enjoy as board games, because there are exceptions. Marvel is a notable one, but there are other exceptions where I enjoy the IP in the board game space. Successful. It reminds me I'm going to do some dishes, aka throw the ones in the sink into the dishwasher. Uh, curious also, the Discord tip I have has helped if you have a chance to try it. Successful, I have not had a chance to use the Discord tip. The Discord tip is specifically when I would be uh, either streaming with Meg, although right now we're in the middle of my island, so we've been doing that in the same place because we need to for the board. And alternatively, when I do the weekly game show with Devin, Meg, and, well, the monthly game show, I guess now, with Devin, Meg, and Jenna. So I, I do plan on using that tip, but have not had an opportunity to do so yet. Three F ups. Got a chance, I think that's what it says. Three FK ups. 3F Cups? I don't I don't really know what your username is. I mean, I know what it is, but I don't know what it's meant. Got a chance to play Star Wars Unlimited with your son yet? No, I haven't, unfortunately. I want to play it. I did learn the rules, so I got I got the first step out of the way. That's an important distinction. Um, but no, I have not had a chance to play it with my son yet. So, um, and why is it I am your father? That's cute. Uh, what did you think of Etherstone? Uh, Etherstone. Etherstone. Okay, there's Everstone discovering Ignis, and then there's Etherstone, which is from Thundergriff, I believe. I've played Everstone Discovering Ignis, which I don't think you're asking about. I think you're asking about Etherstone from Thundergriff, and I haven't played it. Uh, so, actually, fun fact, they did want to send me a copy to cover. Basically, well, for context, this is not meant to be a dig at Thundergriff at all. What I'm about to say next is not a dig. It's just the nature of things that have to be juggled on the back end. So, I did reach out to Thundergriff and said, hey, I'd happily cover Everstone. And they said, okay, great, we'll send you a copy. Um, you have a two-week time frame to cover the game, and they have to send it on to the next person. And I said, hey, I can, again, not a dig at Thundergriff. This is, they're trying to maximize their prototype copies. I'm trying to communicate to you what it's like to balance as a content creator. And so, I replied to them saying, hey, no problem. Just as a, Well, not no problem. I said, very much a problem. I said, just as a heads up, when it comes to preview content, if you want want preview content, we will happily work with a two-week time frame for two reasons. First of all, is there's a paycheck involved, so I'll prioritize it differently. And secondly, is because a preview does not have to be played multiple times to review it. A preview, very often, you know, a single gameplay is enough. Sometimes half a game is enough. The goal of a preview is to be able to talk about it competently, not to offer opinions, so that the, whatever is needed to get to that point is usually less than a review. It's one of those weird things. Preview work is actually less work than review work, but it it's the one that, that we charge for because I'm not going to charge for review work. It's my own personal channel opinion. Other channels can do what they want. For myself, I just don't charge reviews. Uh, so I said I can work with no time frame because I'll review. I'll, I I just I need more than two weeks because I'm not going to rush through it without... It's already hard enough to do this stuff. Here, I'm super glad these start now in West Coast Friendly Time. Yeah, a long time ago, I used to start them at 10 a.m. in the morning, and a long time ago, people asked for a 1 p.m. start time so that both people, well, East Coast and West Coast, can get to it. Uh, international, unfortunately, still has to juggle whatever time frame they're on. 
Wait, was he supposed to change our clothes? He was supposed to change our clothes every day. Uh, Stacy, it depends. Uh, I don't think you have to. I certainly don't, by the way. Fun fact, my pants, uh, my pants rarely get changed. Well, not rarely get changed. That sounds bad. My pants do not get changed every day. I, I'll usually wear, wear jeans for a few days. I'll wear underwear gets changed every day. Socks get changed every day. And my shirt usually gets changed every day. Um, but uh, pants I'll usually wear for a few days at least. Um, I just find that. And, and the biggest thing is obviously is be mindful of BO and have people around you who will tell you if there's BO. But fortunately, I find that the only time I have to deal with BO is usually conventions. And that's usually when I'm at a convention, I'll usually change my pants every day because the amount of walking I'm doing. And even then, sometimes like the sock BO at convention, socks and shoes all day. I mean, I have a spray, it helps, but like, there's a limit. I mean, at the end of the day, there's only so much you can do sometimes. Chromax, any recommendations on what to use for holding tokens or games just doing a game? I have heard small bowls and coasters. Uh, currently, I use these. Ugh, sorry, give me a second here. They're like magnetizing on these coasters here. But I use these from One Sharp Joe. Uh, these are what I use. Um, these are not necessarily the cheapest option out there, uh, but they are like they're like I think they're like twenty five bucks a pop for the cheaper wood. But I could be mistaken. But if you go to One Sharp Joe, One Sharp Joe Crafts .com, I think it's the site, or just Google One Sharp Joe Crafts. You can buy from him on Etsy, or you can buy from him directly on his website. But directly on his website, he'll make more money, and I'm sure he'd appreciate that extra you know difference in cost. And uh, if you're concerned of safety, I'll guarantee you'll get your product. Uh, not a problem there. Uh, anyways, but anyways, I currently use those. Those are my favorite little token containers. There are a lot of options out there. Those are just the ones I currently use. Again, premium, but a little more expensive, so not necessarily. It depends what your what your goal is, what your goal is. I'm a human dishwasher, says Stacy. Well, I mean that's that's many people are. If you don't have a if you don't have a dish, why am I? If you don't have a, why am I blanking on what you call a dish? The dishwasher you call a dishwasher. That's what you call. <laughs> if you don't have an actual dishwasher, washer, then yeah, you're a human dishwasher. Uh, any recommendations? We covered that. Duke, uh, Star, Star Wars Outer Rim is great. Can't recommend enough. Even my friends who aren't big Star Wars fans like it. It's simple, quick setup, fun to price range. I, I, it's a game I've been wanting to play for a while, but I haven't actually gotten around to it. So, I mean, that's a lot of games out there. Jonathan McKay, as soon as I soak my egg pan in the morning, my kids love to sing by the time they leave for school. It never fails. Fun fact, they did a um, they did a study on this with New York subways a long time ago. Uh, well, at some point. I don't know how long ago. They did a study on New York subways with the basic idea of the, st of the study was effectively... Um, they basically had a study where they tracked the amount of time it took for a subway car to get dirty from absolutely clean, meaning how long did it take for the first piece of trash to be on the floor when it was absolutely clean? And then the decreasing amount of time it would then take to continue to fill up. And so the, the gap, I don't remember the actual data, but I remember the, the general idea of it was that the gap they had from clean to the first piece of trash was a fairly long gap. And then as soon as that first piece of trash is there, it's it just becomes a mess immediately. Uh, and that's human nature to a degree. We're all, nobody wants this. The same reason why sometimes if you're going to like a wedding or an event or whatnot, sometimes you'll have a platter of cake with a pre-cut section of slice, a slice is like cut out already. And the reason is the same idea. People often hesitant to do that first thing, whether it's throw the first piece of trash or whether it's to cut the first piece of cake. If you let, open the door for it, then it happens very quickly. Now, in the case of the cake, you want that. You want people consuming the cake. In the case of the trash, you don't want that. So uh, human nature and uh, ways to work around that. Trying out Star Wars Unloaded for the first time tonight. Very excited for it. I, I want to play it badly. I want to play it. I learned, I learned the rules, everything. I watched the Rodney Smith video and everything. I'm playing Star Wars Unlimited right now while watching, really enjoying the game so far. Yeah, I definitely don't plan on going off full collector on it, but I don't mind I don't mind trying to get into it a bit and seeing how it goes. Uh, Lakana as well. Both of them are games that I'm like, kind of like weirdly dabbling in, like have some extra Lakana cards. I'm just not going to go, I'm not going to go full tilt on any of them. Talking about IP, I'm still looking for a great Star Trek game. Seems like Star Wars drew the good space... IP board game raffle. I have heard good things about Star Trek Away Missions. I need to play that actually, but I've heard good things about it. Uh, it's a skirmish game, I think. Check it out. Asked about Under Our Sun because it's alive right now in Game Found and picked up my interest. Maybe you get a chance to cover it doing the two back and not to back. I mean, I'll definitely cover it doing two back and not to back, but there's a difference between covering the campaign and playing the game, so I don't believe I have any plans to play the game as of right now. Say Seth Machine, which I agree with. Chris George had a video about making your own box inserts and recommends a dollar pack of 10 plastic containers. I like Chris George. I like his stuff. I have to watch. I don't know past that, but I like him. Uh, Stacey Everdell says, that's the broken window syndrome. Uh, that makes sense. I mean, it makes sense. It's fascinating. Lacana, I'm working on selling my whole collection. Whoa, successful. Why are you selling your whole entire Lacana collection? What gives? What's the incentive? What's going on? Tell me more. What's happening there? Uh, but yeah, Lurkana, Lurkana and Star Wars Unlimited. I hope to do a video on comparing them. Like, you know, 
I don't know. I hope to do a video on both. We'll see if I do or not. But I want to get a bunch more plays in of Arcana and a bunch more plays in of Star... Well, any plays in of Star Wars Unlimited. Uh, but I, I do want to dive into it and see how they go head-to-head. -head. Uh, I Both of them, rules-wise, are intriguing. I think Star Wars Unlimited seems like it's more up my alley in terms of mechanics. And I think Arcana is much more up my alley in terms of uh, general kid appeal, like for my play with my kids, as well as the... Um, as well as... Uh, theme in general and art production all that like I much prefer the art of Lurkana but the problem is at the end of the day both of them are collectible card games and I don't have the bandwidth for collectible card games I already have a hobby it's called board games so I'll dabble in both but I can't go whole hog like way back in the day I did Magic the Gathering and I did Magic the Gathering whole hog like I I included starting a business around it. I sold Magic the Gathering cards online for the longest time under the website name HB Avatar. Why HB? That was short for Half Blood, which, fun fact, my username on Steam is Half Blood Prince because I created my. with a Y, I believe. With a Y. Um, in fact, my username in Guild Wars for a long time, many of the Guild Wars characters I had were versions of Prince. Prince of Darkness, Prince of Thieves, depending on the character. I full on had a Half Blood Prince character. And the reason for that is because I was very into the, uh, the Harry Potter books when they were coming out, and I created a Steam account and was getting into Guild Wars all around the same time that I read the Half-Blood Prince book. Fun fact, I've said this before on stream, but I remember calling that Snape, spoilers by the way, in case you have not read the Harry Potter universe, spoilers for the next 10 seconds, 20 seconds to be safe. Um, I remember calling to my friends that that Snape was good, that when he killed Dumbledore, he was supposed to kill Dumbledore. Like, I remember calling that 100%. And I was like, I, I was like, there's no, I remember fighting with my friends over it. And now I think, like, I don't know what the perception is now as to whether that was known or not known, but I remember fighting with my friends over it. I was very into it. I was very, very into it. So, um, that was a thing. Grunge Life, Alex playing MMOs. MMOs. I would never have guessed. I love MMOs. Well, that's not true. I love Guild Wars. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I theoretically like MMOs, but I, Guild Wars was a game I sunk my life into. I tried getting back into it recently. I tried downloading the original Guild Wars and starting it again. I just, I don't have that, I don't have that room anymore. But I love, I loved Guild Wars so much. I was so sad when Guild Wars 2 didn't deliver the same experience as Guild Wars 1. And they improved upon some things, but I much preferred the intricacies of the skill trees and the way skills work together in Guild Wars 1. It was some of my... Like, I don't, I'm not one of those people who has nostalgia for, like, oh, I wish I was in high school, I wish this, I wish that. I don't really, I usually am very, like, my life right now, I love my life. I'm so grateful for my life, and I'm generally very happy about my life. Um, but the one thing I do have nostalgia for is Guild Wars 1. Like, the years playing Guild Wars 1 was so good. Some of, like, some of the best moments in my life, in theory. Not, like, it's just not best moments. That sounds so, that's, that's, not, that's not true. It should have not true. But I have nostalgia. I have nostalgia for playing through Guild Wars 1. Lakana, successful. The difficulty in getting cards to be able to play and early on killed my excitement entirely. Yeah, that definitely happened for me. Uh, my kids still like Lurkana, so I'm still going to dabble in it, but I'm not going to be heavily investing it. I was mainly getting into it for my wife. She has no interest. Star Wars is for me. That does it. Daniel Chance. I did the same except for two decks. It's fun, but I just can't get out to Lurkana night. I don't want to keep pouring money into it when I'm not playing. Reasonable. I played last night in Acony. It's, it's, it's not that fascinating. I go, don't get why everybody puts it so high and the theme wasn't really there. What's your opinion? I read the rules for an Acony right when COVID was starting for the very first time. And I was reading it. I was like, oh, whatever. Our game night will be starting soon. We'll play an Acony. And I never did. And I still, like, I remember I read the full rules. I was ready for it. But that was like four years ago now. Um, so I haven't played an Acony, but I vaguely remember the rules. Um, the biggest thing I would say is there's usually... When a game doesn't land for you, there's two ways to approach it. There is, it didn't land for me, or I don't know why this landed for everyone else. And I usually recommend approaching it from the stance of it didn't land for you. Uh, there's always going to be people who enjoy games. There's always going to be popular games that don't land for you. People love Wingspan. I'm okay with it. People love Earth. I think it's a good game. I don't I don't love, like, I like Earth. I genuinely like it. But, like, I, people have, like, rave about it, and I'm like, it's not that good. Like, I think I gave it a 4 to 5, and even in my head, I'm like, in my head, I think of it as lower. Not because it's lower, but because I'm like, people, like, think the world of that game. Uh, there's a lot of games that I either enjoy, or uh, Dwellings of Elvedale. I thought was fine. People love it. There's always going to be great games that don't land for any number of individuals. Usually the biggest thing I'd say is if you're looking within the same realm of people who share your tastes, because obviously you can't count things like Monopoly. If people love Monopoly, and I don't think people love Monopoly, that's a different conversation, but whatever. But if people like something outside of your realm, then that's your different kind of subset. But if you're within the subset of board game fans who play the types of board games that we all play, and a game doesn't land for you, it's, it's just, that happens. That's life. Uh, we're not all going to love everything, and that is what it is, and that's okay. It's okay to not love everything. It saves you money in the long run. Alex playing MMOs. I cover that. Have you played Space Alert from CG? I'm going to test it this week. No, it's one of those games I've had several times. Always wanted to table and just never got a table. Eventually, I gave up. I'm always happy to play it, but just never got a table. 
Prior, my parents sold my Magic the Gathering collection back in 1999 was in college, let me knowing I had alpha and beta, and I cry whenever I think of the amount of money I could have made. Don't cry too harshly. You also probably could have bought Bitcoin when it was like $7 a piece and be have tons and tons of money. There's always opportunities to have lost a ton of money. Granted, usually it's your own fault. This time it's your parents' fault, but try not to resent them too much. Three FK ups. Do you know if the reception has been good for Star Wars Unlimited? Loving the game, but on release day at my local store, everyone's just playing Magic the Gathering. Interesting. I have generally seen good reception from the people who've been playing it, but I don't know how that translates into sales or hype and buzz. I've just seen overall good reception around it. Ken Costin. Hello, Ken. How's it going? Real Sphinx. So now that you've built a new computer, going to give us two a try again. I was also just hopping to say hi. The new computer has not been built. All the parts are now here, finally. Like, I finally just got the last part the other day, but um, the new computer is going to be built probably in the next week or two, but I will not be giving Guild Wars 2 a try. I've given, like, my instinct is if I was going to give any game a try, I'd go back to Guild Wars 1. Like, Guild Wars 1 was, was where it's at. Guild Wars 2, I've given hundreds of hours, and it's not for me. Also, if you hear any of the drilling, that would be the uh, AC stuff I told you about. I'm on the fence. Nope, not that one. Uh, Jonathan K. I was deep into MTG as well. Still enjoying occasional draft. I got into board games thinking it would save me money. I mean, how many board games could I possibly need? Yeah, I still had... when I, I transferred out of MTG a while ago. And then I got into board games and I still had a set of probably around, I don't know, five dollars $600 worth of MTG left. And I got rid of that to fuel my uh, board game hobby. But uh, I think MTG is great. I have a harder time getting into things halfway, which is my biggest problem. That's why like, I'm very much an all or nothing personality. I've always said that the reason I don't gamble at all is because if I did gamble at all, I would go crazy. I, I've always had an all or nothing personality. I've always been like, again, I got into Magic the Gathering. I started selling Magic the Gathering and ran a Magic the Gathering store for a few years. I got into board games. I started a board game store and then started doing board game videos. I now work for GameFound. I, I tend to go all in on the hobbies that I embrace. I did Guild Wars. When I did Guild Wars, I printed out an entire binder of, I was going on a trip at one point when I was into Guild Wars, and I was going to be gone for a month. And so I printed out an entire binder of every single skill so that I can build characters in like a paper binder. That's like I didn't have a phone at the time. I didn't have like anything smart or tablets or whatever. And so I printed out a paper binder so I could build characters and come up with like character builds for, for, for Guild Wars because I was into it. Whenever I've been into things, I get very into them, which means I don't gamble at all. That's also why I briefly dabbled in crypto and then got out of it very quickly. I, I got into crypto when Bitcoin was worth around uh, 20k, I want to say. Um, and I decided to finally, I was like, you know what? I believe in it. I'm here. Let's go ahead and do it. But I also didn't want to invest money that I wasn't prepared to lose. Never. And when it comes to cryptocurrency, don't invest money you're not prepared to lose. And so I put, I believe it was $3,500 into Bitcoin. Something like that. Maybe it was 3200 It was around whatever it was. Somewhere in that range as far as putting that money into Bitcoin. And then I proceeded to start following like 7,000 uh, at the time, Twitter, but now X, I guess. I followed a ton of uh, Twitter accounts from cryptocurrency experts, and I started watching cryptocurrency stuff every single day. And effectively what happened is I wasn't willing to invest more than 3500 because I didn't want to lose more than 3500 um, I didn't want to lose 3500 either, but that was my t risk tolerance. But the problem is for the 3500 I was now watching crypto stuff all day long, and I was getting super into it. And I was like, I have a choice. The amount of time I'm investing into this mentally is disproportionate to the amount of money. So I could either up the amount of money or just tap out entirely because it's just not worth it. It's just not worth being sucked into it. And so I tapped out entirely. Uh, the, over my, my term of doing crypto, I think I lost like $200 by the time all said and done. I had won and lost and won and lost. And then it was actually a crash and I held on to the crash until it recovered a bit. I think also all, all told, I think I like invested 3500 in crypto and walked away with 3200 by the time it was done. But that involved the market fully crashing and me waiting to sell it off again. Anyways, my point is I'm very all or nothing. Valent, which ones do you prefer? Going all in on expansions, trying to sell them if you... Wait, going all in, what do you prefer? Going all in on expansions and trying to sell them if you end up not liking the game or pledge the standard level and try to get the expansions from retail if you like it. I go all in. Uh, if I'm interested in a game, I go all in. There are very few exceptions to that. There are exceptions, but very, very few. It's not necessarily the better choice, but it's the choice I usually make. I'm on the fence with Dying Light with this one. I mean, the flip side, I'll say, again, ignore, don't do what I do. I'm backing fewer Kickstarters for a reason, uh, but fewer crowdfunding campaigns for a reason. But I do think that going all in on everything, I, I've done two full videos on this. I did a full video of times I've gone all in that I'm very happy and I've used all the content and times I've gone all in and I've not used all the content. Um, I recommend watching those if you're trying to get a sense. Uh, it obviously reflects my experience, not necessarily yours, but there are types of games where I'm more likely to benefit from the content and others where I'm not. Speaking of Earth, the interview with designers suggests the new expansion will address a lot of the complaints we had. We'll see. Ooh, I'm intrigued. Again, I like Earth, so I'm happy to play it. I'm very intrigued to play the expansion. D 
Deep McCrossen, have you played Kinfire Chronicles? I want to play it, but not available. I have not played Kinfire Chronicles. It's on my list of things to play, uh, but also I know they've been doing the dollar pledge, and I know, I, I, I mean, I imagine however far up I was on their reviewer list, I'm a, I'm a few notches down now because they were a company that, and they they screwed up in my opinion because I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spend too much time. Uh, fighting the dollar pledge in this video i will say iv games did note in like their newsletter that they're probably not doing it again which i thought was interesting so either they're looking at the community pushback or it wasn't as profitable to be worth even whatever pushback there is but i thought that was interesting they didn't say a guarantee but it seemed like they might not but i'll say past that i'm getting a phone call i may have to answer it we'll find out i don't know uh but anyways um the dollar thing. So the dollar pledge. So I've been very actively against the whole dollar newsletter concept. And Kinfire Chronicles, they put out a BGG forum post explaining why they're doing it. And in my opinion, they took the worst possible. I'm about to go. I'm about to go further down the reviewer list. Uh, in my opinion, they took the worst possible approach to talking about why they're doing it. I think that the way to do it, if you're going to do the dollar newsletter thing at all, then I think the way to do it is to do it with. Um, to do it the way IV did it, where they're basically like, hey, we don't know how we feel about this, but it is something that could be a win-win, and so we are going to experiment that we'll see how we'll do, and then they listen to their community. And they talked about the reasons to do it, they talked about why it's helpful, why it's a win-win, they expressed their hesitancy. I think that ultimately, if you're going to do it at all, do it the way IV Games did it. Um, I think there's another company that's going to be taking the dollar and giving it to charity. They're doing that, which is also interesting. I think that's another good way to do it. So I think there are good ways to communicate. I don't like the practice at all, but if you're going to do it, there's better and worse ways to do it. It's no different than fake funding goals. Like if you're going to have a fake funding goal, there is a difference between having a fake funding goal of 20,000 when you really need 100,000 versus having a fake funding goal of 50,000 when you need 100,000. There are always, even if you can do something that's not ideal, there are still better and worse ways to do it. But uh, in their case, they went on to BGG and they posted a forum post explaining why it's like in your best interest. And they use a lot of marketing speech, which BGG wasn't buying at all. No one in that forum post was buying it. And everyone was like, oh, it's for our benefit. Oh, and this, oh, and that. And like, it was... They didn't take a, hey, we're mixed and conflicted, but we feel we have to try things. They took a, here's how, it's a win-win for you, and then no one no one bought it. And so, again, that's just marketing speech. You have to know your audience. You have to know, like, there are times where you can engage in marketing speech and get away with it. I think the Reddit community, I think the BG community, I think there are times when people are, they can, they, they know what, they know what they smell, and it's, um, it's not chocolate. Uh, I feel the same way as Ark, with Ark Nova and Terraforming Mars. We own both start to play, but stop playing after an hour. They didn't test as hard as for other games. I will finally be reviewing Ark Nova soon. I think I'm I think I'm ready to review it. I I have consistently given Ark Nova another game and another game and another game. Keep thinking that the next one will be the one that crosses the line for me. Ultimately, I don't think I enjoy Ark Nova. I, it's not bad, but the it involves the same mental thought as Terraforming Mars for me, with none of the same payoff for me. I respect that it's a well-loved game, I will be reviewing it, and I kept thinking one more game will do it for me, and it's not happening, so I'm not here for Ark Nova, unfortunately. But I do love Terraforming Mars. Expedition is a bit of a slog for us right now on the table. Priya, I do highly recommend not playing Expeditions at 5 player. I think, I don't know what you're playing it at, but it's not, I don't recommend it at 5. I think it is best at 3. And I think it's good at four and two, but five players is kind of a slog in my opinion. Same with Apiary. Apiary, I think, is not good with five. I think Apiary is very good with two and three. It's good with four, and it's not good with five in my opinion. Uh, Stonemaier Games, for better or for worse, they make their titles one to five, and I think there are better player counts for a variety of games, including those games. Prior, I'd love to try both again, but I feel like it's a game that I need to dedicate a day to relearn the rules and to play. That is always the hard part with games you're unsure of. It. You have to like still relearn them, but now there's less investment to relearn them. Again, I do highly recommend purging your games on a regular basis of the ones that you're not going to play. JB, with all the new IV Studio... That was drilling. JB, with all the new IV Studios games and expansions coming out, I was curious where you rank their games currently. Really, JB? JB... That was the very first question, and I already answered it. So I'm not, that was your question, your question. So I already answered that question. You'll have to go back to the, uh, like, I don't know, minute six of stream, minute five of stream, but I did answer it, so I'm not going to do it again. Stacy, oh, no, Briar, that one arrives tomorrow for me. Expeditions, Expeditions is great. Stacy, don't listen to him. Don't you listen to him. Expeditions is amazing, okay? Don't you listen to him. Pariah, Carrie loves it. I'm a little more lukewarm on it currently. You see, listen to Carrie. Carrie knows what's up. Priya, how do you both feel with Scythe? I know they are different, but it's the same world, which I love. I didn't love Scythe, by the way, Stacey. I think, Scythe, I think Scythe is good. I think Scythe is a good game, and I've enjoyed playing it, but I have not fallen in love with it, although the giant big box kind of makes me want it, which is a problem, and it means I'm just here for the new shiny. Or the big shiny. It doesn't have to be new, honestly. I love Scythe, I love Scythe uh, says Pariah. Ark Nova will never hit my table based on the art alone. Sorry, <laughs> I, I hear that, but also I assume you'd have the same opinion of Terraforming Mars, and I love Terraforming Mars. 
Board Game Geek Triarc No Worth Expansion. Yeah, I I don't I don't I'm I don't think I'm not feeling the love. Like I'm not feeling the love. It's a, it's is it an is it even a three point five? I don't think it's a three point five for me. Wow, I think it's a three for me. So the distinction between a three point five and a three is when I play a three point five, when I play a three point five for me, is, I it's a, the difference. And I say this all the time, but I, I think it's worth repeating is. For me, I have a twinge of sadness that I will not be still playing it. A lot of games are 3.5. A lot of games I have, I, I just wish I had more time. With Ark Nova, I think for a while, I think had I reviewed it after game two, I might have even given it a four. But the more I've played it, trying to get it higher, the the less I've been interested in it. I think I've, I think I've explored it enough that it's a solid three for me. Interesting. I have to think about that. That is a that is a weakness with my reviewing system. If I give a game too much time, it can go lower. It's a weakness there. I have to figure that out. But that's where that's where it is for me right now. Okay, where are we up to? I caved into playing Terraform Mars a few months ago. I just hated it. Part of my enjoyment is playing a nice looking games, and TM is the ugliest one I've played. I don't disagree with you on the concept. I had uh, someone comment on my video the other day where there was a video where I gave a game a rating, and I commented. I said I said the art and graphic design really hold the game back for me. I am dinging it because of that. And I had someone say like I can't believe you would adjust your rating for a game based on the way it looks. And I'm like. Of course I would. Like, to me, that's part of the process. That's like, that's, that's no different than taste and smell, where a smell is a component of, of taste. It affects your enjoyment of the game. There are absolutely games that I am less likely to pull out because they don't look good. And there are games I'm more likely to pull out because they do look good. It's absolutely a component for me. So as much as I disagree with you on Terraforming Mars in general, I understand and agree with your point. Good afternoon, everyone. I summoned to defend Anachrony. Ryan, you, you have to be fine. I got you. I got you back. I haven't played Anachrony. I defended it, sort of. Critter Kitchen is fun at five players. Yes, Meg. Critter Kitchen is actually the reverse. Critter Kitchen is a game that's better at four and five players. I think at three, it suffers. I don't think it's nearly as good at three. Ryan, hello, Professor Meg. Stacy, Terraform Mars, I would, I would try. It looks overwhelming as all. Probably not for my collection, but I play with others who know the game. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. Like, I just... Uh, Professor Meg, hello. A Pariah, much like Beyond the Sun. Ugly as sin. Yes, exactly. Beyond the Sun is a game that if it looked better, I think I'd still own it. As it is, I'm like, whatever, I'll play it on BGA. Like, it's a good game. I gave it a four to five. I think Beyond the Sun is amazing. But it looks so dry. Like, give me bad clip art over nothing at all. Like, it's it's not there. The gameplay of Daniel Chance is the gameplay of Terraforming Mars. is good enough for me to look past any art issues. A hundred percent agree. That's exactly who I am. Eric says, if a game rating goes down after further plays, it's not a flaw in the rating mythology. That's a game that didn't stand up to further plays. Eric, so here's the problem. That's not a flaw in the rating mythology. Here's the flaw with the rating methodology, okay? My, my rule in general is I don't play game. I don't review games I played once. That's a general rule. Fine. But I have reviewed games I've played twice. I try to play them more, but I have reviewed games I've played twice, three times, four times, five times, whatever. And the tricky part there is I do think that there are times... Again, Ark Nova is a good example. If I had just given up after, not given up, if, I, if after three plays of Ark Nova, I had rated it, it would have been at least a 3.5, at least. But I kept exploring it further because I kept having this feeling that if I played it more, then it might go higher. But by doing so, I think I've actually lowered the rating. By now, I've played enough times that I I kept trying to make it go higher, and I'm th I think I'm just tapped out. I don't even have the regret of never playing it again. I think I'm good. I've I've explored it enough. So the the flaw in the rating method metho metho methodology is the fact that it's not a game should hold up to multiple plays. But I'm giving you a rating, and that rating reflects my experience with the game. So had I rated Ark Nova after three plays, I would have given it a three point five probably. Whereas where I'm getting it now, I'm giving it a three. So that's the tricky part. So it's if I play a game more it might get a lower rating. Now, sometimes the reverse is true. It might get a larger rating. And ultimately, by the way, I'm okay with the flaws. I think that in life, it's very hard to have a perfect system, no matter what you do. And even just the most basic idea of being a content creator and reviewer, you can either review fewer games more diligently or less games more whatever. And also, by the way, another thing that's interesting is even channels that put out reviews every two or three weeks or whatnot, or less frequent reviews, based on things they've said in the past, I don't think they necessarily give it more plays either. I think just rating games is always going to be a flawed concept. Rating anything is going to be a flawed concept with limited information, and we just have to do the best we can, which is why I'm a big fan of sites like BoardGameOfTheYear.org that, that aggregate the information so that even though you are dealing with flawed information, if you pull enough flawed data sets together, it actually is more likely to result in somewhat cleaner data, if that makes sense. It, it For statistics people out there, it does make sense, but I'm saying it for you if it makes sense. Prior, that one is a game that reminded me of Galactic Cruise. It kind of pushed me off due to the blandness of it. Wait, what? what's a game that reminded you? Beyond the Sun reminded you of Galactic Cruise? I don't feel they're the same at all. Having played both, don't feel the same at all. 
I'm gonna sell Vindication really cool than it after 40 plays. I mean, honestly, if you've cooled on it after 40 plays, you've given it 40 plays, that's plenty. Uh, but I, I love Vindication. It makes me sad to hear you say that, but that's okay. We're allowed to have different tastes and opinions. Da Dean McCroson, what are the best restaurants at Gen Con? I got no clue. I got no clue. I, ask somebody else. I, I Yeah, I got no clue. Uh, Balance suppose it's weird because every subscription looks really good with components, dual layer boards. I actually enjoyed that. Went through and bought a few weeks after, and it's from the same publisher. Yeah, that's true. Evidel, uh, Stacy, Evidel looks absolutely fact looks absolutely factor in. So many factors affect one's enjoyment versus like versus not like. I like to carry more since I got the collector's box storage. Yeah, I, again, I think I think deluxified components, deluxified anything like Foundations of Rome is going to have a more accessible version coming out at some point, but with like tiles instead of miniatures, and I think the miniatures add to the table presence. And the table presence adds to the enjoyment. And the overall experience is a, a summation of everything. I think all things go into the experience from the how easy are the rules? How easy is it to teach others? How long does it teach? What's the complexity versus depth? There are so many factors that go into the experience of a game that are, are all present. That just make, I don't know, they're all present. They're, they're all, here's the only factor I don't like, okay? Oh, this might be an interesting conversation. The only factor I don't like is when something outside of the experience of the game affects your enjoyment of the game. But I also acknowledge that it could happen, I just don't like it. So, for example, um, if you're talking about something like, um, let's say, the game, the, the like, let's say Mythic, uh, not, uh, not Mythic Mystery, Mythic Mystery is great, uh, uh, Mythic Games, I meant. Mythic Games, let's talk about Mythic Games. In Mythic Games, if you don't enjoy Six Siege because you had such a terrible experience getting it, that makes sense, but that's where I'm, like, more conflicted on. If, the, if you buy something from Amazon and it arrives a week late and so you rate the product negatively, I'm like, you should be shot. Not actually shot. That's bad. Don't do that. My lawyer says don't say that. I don't have a lawyer. I mean, I do have a lawyer, but not, not did nothing for this. Anyways, um, but you, like people who, who rate a product negatively because it arrived late from the carrier or even for the, 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 whatever, those things drive me nuts. But there are, it is an interesting conversation because... Your experience with the game can be tainted, especially in something like Mythic Games. You could have a tainted experience with the game where you're, like, for instance, Chai Tea for Two. I absolutely have that. Chai Tea for Two is a game I enjoyed. I think I have no interest in actually playing it right now. I think I have no interest whatsoever, even if it did show up. I think I'd get rid of it as soon as it came in. And that's, I don't think I would re rate the game because I, I like separating those things. But I understand. It's an interesting conversation, interesting sub conversation. Uh, Pariah. Galactic Cruise reminds me of On Mars in terms of components, different mechanics though. Haven't played On Mars, can't comment. Uh, Brian, obligatory, obligatory question, Alex. Have you played New Miles of Vindication yet? No. No, but I should. I should. Austin, restaurants at Gen Con, Root and Bone, Ash and Elm, Sidery. First of all, Austin, hi, welcome aboard. Also, thank you for the restaurant suggestions. Brian, I think it was the white cards that got randomized especially on the board. Probably the only component that's similar, but also a component that covers a lot of the board. Interesting. Uh, Stacy, Blood on the Clock Tower comes to mind. I hear what you're saying there. Heard Kemet Blood and Sound was getting re-released this year. Uh, heard First Edition had a one vs many mode and also a crossover with Cyclades. This thing chance for getting those back in Blood and Sand? No, I the one vs many the one vs many mode I don't think was well received enough that I'd be skeptical if they put it back in there. And the crossover that was from the same publisher at the time. Now they're no longer the same publisher. I think it is less likely. Austin Harrison, Austin, that's surprised you're saying hi to you. Dean, have I recently played Res Arcana? Loving it. Any game similar to it? Yes, yes, there is a game similar to Res Arcana. Um, I think Spellbook. Spellbook has a similar feel to Res Arcana. Uh, this is a new one from Osbede. I think it's a very similar vibes. Austin says hi back. Brian, not, not shot, hit in the face with a fish. Still violent, but also ridiculous. I like that. They should be hit in the fish with, hit in the face with a fish. I, I think that's a better, appropriate thing. I lost my hoodie to my wife. I need a new one in the Veiled Fate PM. Austin Harrison, LOL, sounds good. How is, uh, do you have new Veiled Fate merch, Austin? Are you, uh, did you even have Veiled Fate merch the first time around? Hit in the face, hit in the fish, hit in the fish with a face. I don't think that's as, I mean, I'd probably say that, but I don't think it's as good. Um, but also, Austin, now that you're here, congrats on the Veil of Fate campaign. Anyone who wants to go ahead and back Veil of Fate, it's over on Kickstarter. Please, by all means, go ahead and check it out. And they have all these expansion goodies, and they have like a center thingy that's very cool that you can get in plastic and metal. Is that what it is, Austin? Is that the center thing? I I, I read most of the newsletter, but I haven't looked at the campaign, not in depth. I, 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 I browsed it. Yeah, there's a Veil of Fate hoodie. Cool, 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 cool. But anyways, um, yeah, that's kind of how we're doing time. We're doing time. We still have time. Aw, shucks. Austin, you're a delightful human being. When do I get to see you next? Origins? You're, not, you're probably not going to Origins, are you? You're probably not. You're done with Origins. Is it? Is it Gen Con the next time I see you? That's way too far away. Uh, Brian, the Austin? Nice. It is the Austin. Yes, it is. Uh, Balint, uh, I really want to go all in on flow as I tend to love kitchen sink type games. They have tons of luxe upgrades. It doesn't feel right. Chilling got $130 plus flat plus shipping for a board game. 
that's the light side of things. Uh, when you start spending $500 for a single board game, that's when you know you're in trouble. Austin, I may come alone, but Brink before Gen Con. What's Brink? What's Brink? Do I not know what Brink is? Um, but also, if you come alone, that'd be awesome. I'd love to hang out. I do not think I'll be doing a GameFound booth this year, so I'll be a little more free. And I don't know what Brink is, so I'm just going to say uh, enjoy Brink, and maybe I'll be at Brink, because Brink might be a thing that I actually know about, but I don't... Oh, oh, oh! Brink! I understand what Brink is. I got to it before your Ivy's first worker placement game. I, I was like, what show is Brink? And then I realized Brink is not a show. Brink is your worker placement game. Ooh, that's before Gen Con. Good to know. Awesome. I'm excited. Uh, anyways. Oh, yeah. Speaking of which, by the way, uh, it's actually funny because Ivy Games is doing his first wor uh, worker placement game. Um, I think uh, Chip Theory Games just did their first area control game. People dabbling with different genres in their own genres. Although, although I, I admit, uh, Chip Theory Games as well, they're dabbling with a whole new look. Like, Roth is a new everything. New price point, new illustration st uh, style, new style of game in general, where the focus is more multiplayer, although they do have a solo and co-op. I will, by the way, I've had a lot of people ask for solo and co-op on, um, on Roth, and I will try to do a playthrough of solo slash co-op before the game ends. I am not making any guarantees but I will try to. Uh, the, the, the main restriction on my end, the reason I didn't cover it all until now is because I was told by them that they're already changing things even as I was getting the game. And I was like, if you're changing things, if you already think the version you have right now still needs tweaking, even though even though prototype to final game will get tweaks, if you're currently telling me that your version right now is still not where you want it to be, then that's, and that's not the way they phrase it, but the way they phrased it made it sound like I, it needs some, I need some updated rules. So I didn't cover it in time for the review, but... I should have a chance. I'll be at PAX East. Manny Tremblay's at PAX East. Um, if I have a chance to play Roth solo co-op with him or even just get a, a rule set of how to do it, then I will try to do so. We'll see. Austin, Roth looks so good. Got back at 143. Enjoy that. Uh, back counts are interesting. Once upon a time, I used to try to get back at number one, specifically on command games. I was like, I'll get back at number one. And then I stopped, I stopped caring. Kind of like commenting first on YouTube. Like, it has some measure of something but i don't know if it's like i have a friend here if you want a claim to fame here's a claim to fame for you this one actually does feel cool to me because it's not like a constant thing you can keep doing it's a one-time thing i have a friend who is i think he's like the 142nd user on board game geek okay so he is the 142nd on you 142nd user on boardgamegeek.com that feels cool like boardgamegeek.com has 3 million plus users and to be there that early that feels cool, even though it's not first, because like first would be Aldi, I assume. But uh, that felt cool. Like I was like, I was like, wow, you really were old school. Because he's an old school gamer. He's older than me. He's like ten years older than me. He's been gaming for like longer than like, ten years longer than I got into the hobby. He was there when board game geek began, basically. Uh, he's like, oh, aside from board games, cool, and he joined it. So that's pretty cool. Brian, how do you feel about games like crowdfund with one concept that completely changed the game from the original concept? Kingdoms Forlorn comes to mind. Has Kingdoms Forlorn completely changed the way they they do it? Um, as far as how do I feel about it, so it depends on how much you mean by completely changed. I think that's the biggest question I have, because the tricky part is we are constantly told back in a game is not buying a game. We're constantly told that, but then also everyone feels scammed if they don't get the game. Not to say scammed. There's a difference between a scam and something failing. But you feel you feel like uh, short shorted if you don't get a game after you back it, and that's reasonable. I think you should deserve to get a game. I do think. I do think that for a game to completely change the concept, let's say, I think, um, uh, oh my gosh, the, the Divinity Original Sin did this a lot. I think if you sell somebody on a concept and you go through the process and you change it, I think that to me, I am sympathetic to the backer, but I think that is part of crowdfunding. I think there's like an edge case where you're being sold sold a product and you're not getting it, where it's like, you're, it's like oh, well, you're just supporting the project. No, you told me you're getting a product, you have to do that. Whereas I think crowdfunding is about bringing things to life. And I think that changes are part of the process. And so I'm much more sympathetic to it. I'm sympathetic on all counts. I'm sympathetic to the backer as well. But I think that if you're joining for the creation process and you're being promised an end good, that's one thing. But if you're joining for the creation process and they cha choose to change that, I think that is more within the spirit of crowdfunding for me. And I recognize not everyone will see it the same way, but I think, I think that's where I am on that. I think I'm okay with it. Ideally, I would like them to offer a refund, even if the fees are taken out. Even if they're like, "Hey, we'll offer a full a refund with the fees taken out." Even if they do that, I think that should be on the table. But I, I'm more, I'm sympathetic to all sides. But I think it's more than the spirit of crowdfunding. Balance says to my girlfriend, "I'll have a hard time convincing her that, hey, babe, I'm going to be buying two games one to two years in advance for one fifth of my paycheck." I respect that. Buy responsibly. Buy with others. Uh, Dennis, I'm considering selling my pledge of Kingdoms Forlorn. Dennis, is this because of that reason? Is this because of their changing? Like, what do they change? Because someone tell me what they. Okay. From what I understand about Kingdoms Forlorn, it was shown as a roguelike card narrative game. Now they're talking about a more traditional dungeon crawler. 
it felt like a traditional dungeon crawler. Like I played Kingdoms Forlorn. I feel I played Kingdoms Forlorn. It felt like a dungeon crawler. I'm trying to think. Like, I don't think it felt like a roguelike narrative card game to me. And they had like a section where you explored, but that was my least favorite part. My least favorite part was the exploration stuff. Like the dungeon crawler stuff just felt like dungeon crawler. I don't know if I got roguelike senses from it, from playing it. Uh, Brian, Dennis, my problem with it is more to how unprofessional and petty I believe Into the Unknown has been surrounding the games like ATO. Oh, uh, yeah. Into the Unknown. Like there's obviously the entire drama around what happened. And while I have my thoughts on the drama in general, I definitely agree that Into the Unknown did come across the way they presented and sometimes it's an international thing in the way they are but I, I do agree that into the unknown i don't think that they presented the best way that they could have i think they could have handled things in a way that i think they could have handled things in a way that made people more on their side so to speak but i think that they they kind of forced people to choose between different things that whatever uh, yeah I, I don't want to talk too much about it obviously but um yeah i i understand where you're coming from dennis also good to see you dennis it's been a while Sendaka, how would you rate Veil Fate of Two Players? I have not played Veil Fate of Two Players, so I can't answer that. Um, I never played at Two Players. I played it at four. I played it at six, at seven, at eight. I think those are all the play counts. I don't know if I've done a five player game of Veiled Fate. I think it's four, six, seven, eight are the play counts. I don't think I ever played it online. Like, my first introduction to IV Games, IV Studios, was doing their crowdfunding campaign when I, when I covered Veil Fate at the time. Um, and then I had an interview with Austin, talked about the changes. I remember talking about all that stuff. They listened to the community, which was great. But uh, I never actually played it. So I'm um, not doing the crowdfunding campaign. I played it later. Brian, fun fact, people in other countries speak to others in different manners. I work with people in the Netherlands. They tend to be very abrupt. That isn't considered rude there. Yes, Brian. So that's, this, is something, this is what I'm saying. So, like, I don't know if it's a tonal country thing in general. I do know, having worked with a lot of com countries in different ways, both in my last job uh, as, as a COO of an e-commerce company, dealt with a lot of countries, both with our developers. We had developers in Argentina and Ukraine, uh, developers in India. So we had a lot of developers all over the place and also speaking to clients in other countries. But then also in the board game space, I uh, played a lot of different... I, I've interacted with a lot of different publishers, and it sometimes it requires a reminder to understand that when someone else speaks a little bit more abruptly, that just is, sometimes it's a cultural thing. It doesn't represent upsetness; it's a cultural thing. Also, if you hear banging on the dents again, they're working on the things. I'm gonna probably I'm gonna try to wrap this up on time today, primarily because I want to give them the freedom to make more noise. Although I told them make whatever noise you need, and they are right now. Uh, without expansions, I wouldn't. Without expansions, I wouldn't. Not sure if the new expansion changes that. Okay. Uh, Brian, fun fact, and we covered that. Peri, Veil Fate, Hadria is so much fun. Hadria is definitely a better way to play Veil Fate. I don't think I would ever play Veil Fate without Hadria. Hadria is one of the modules in the new in the new game. Uh, my biggest problem with Veil Fate is that often in Veil Fate, and again, I think this problem is minimized at, at, at in the team's player counts, at 6, 7, and 8, but at lower player counts, I feel often my choice is to be obvious to the point where you know who I am, or be more subtle, but then be compromising my gameplay accordingly. I think Hadria changes that. Hadria allows for a lot of subtle plays that really changes my whole opinion of Veil Fate. I still don't know if I love it at lower player counts. I have to play it, honestly. But um, I, I, do think Veil, I do think Hadria is a always play with module. Brothers Murph just played out two and released a video. Check out Brothers Murph. They're a fantastic channel. Brothers Murph, by the way, they don't get enough credit because not only do they do incredibly solid gameplay videos that are worth watching on their own, but they do these incredible, like, three to four minute, like, spots before the video explaining how the game is played that is some of the best in the business. Like, they are used legitimately for some crowdfunding campaigns, and I think they should be. Like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end this video soon. I'm getting the thing in. But anyways, but yeah, Brothers Murph, they don't... I, I think they, it almost gets short-sold because if you don't want to watch a playthrough, you won't see the little how-to-play segment that they do at the beginning. So if you don't want to watch a playthrough but you want a good overview on a game, watch the first five minutes of a Brothers Murph playthrough. It is fantastically well done. Ryan, I arrived late. Studio, new studio, another place in the basement, trying new stuff out. I am indeed, Ryan. Uh, hi, sorry, what is this drama? Am I missing something into the known? Can somebody explain, please? Oh, boy, I'm going to leave that one alone for right now. There was a whole drama around Into the Unknown and around coverage of Into the Unknown, but I'm going to try to avoid that uh don D dean not don dean <laughs> have you tried a commands dead keep is similar to homicide dead keep is arriving tomorrow and um i hope to be playing it as soon as i possibly can but i don't know exactly how fast dennis you're fine don't worry about it you're fine dennis but also it's just good to see you uh but anyways i think i am gonna wrap this up it's a little bit two minutes before the thing but i'm getting a lot of banging from the ac thing that's being changing right now so i'm gonna try to end on time ish today uh but i will try for a live stream next week i can't make any guarantees but the next two weeks um I'm gone on Thursday, unfortunately, and Thursday is currently the live stream, so we'll see how it works out, but I would like to try to make things work, because I, I don't like going too long without live content uh, nowadays. I enjoy it. Anyways, until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I appreciate all of you being here as usual, and um, 
Oh, Gagak, you can just, you can Google. You can Google. In any case, until I'll, until next time, I hope you all have a good one, and I will hopefully see you live shortly, and if not, I will, um, we'll see you whenever. We'll figure it out. This video is going up all the time. We'll talk. We'll have a conversation. We'll talk.